Well, hello everyone. Welcome to our panel this afternoon. I'm glad that you could join us. I hope you're having a great afternoon. My name is Chris Enns and I am the moderator for this session. I am a global training programs specialist at the University of Calgary, as well as a board member of the Canadian Association of International Development Professionals, which is the voice of Canada's international development community. Um, I've worked in the field of international development and education for 20 years. I'm excited to be hosting this session. Uh, my colleague Noel will be working in the background to help facilitate with everything, but I think uh, we'll have a great afternoon, good discussion, and I'm glad that you can join us. Just before we begin, I wanna acknowledge that I'm joining you from the University of Calgary in Alberta, uh, which is located within the traditional territories of the Treaty 7 region in Southern Alberta which includes the Blackfoot Confederacy, comprising the Siksika, Pikani, and Kainai First Nations, as well as the Stony Nakoda, including the Chiniki, Bears Paw, and Wesley First Nations, and the Sutina First Nation. The city of Calgary is also home to Métis Nation of Alberta, Alberta Region 3. So we have panelists and participants from all across the country, uh, and I encourage you to take time to reflect on the territory that you are from. Um, our panel today is uh, looking at examples of Canadian leadership on the international stage in achieving the sustainable development goals with a particular focus on inclusion and diversity and reaching marginalized uh, communities. And so uh, we've got a, a number, three panelists that will be sharing their experiences with you. And I, we intend to make this an interactive discussion. So uh, please think about your questions and comments and put them in the chat or the Q&A section as we go. And we will have time at the end uh, for our panelists to address it. So our panel today uh, includes representatives from Global Affairs Canada, which is the arm of the Canadian government dealing with trade development and defense. Uh, so um, we have Aaron Quibell from Global Affairs Canada, who will be talking about some of their work. Uh, we also have Tando Malambo from International Development Research Council, which is a crown corporation looking at international development research around the world. And then we also have Representative Tanya Saluski from Alenia International, which is a global international development consultant, consulting agency uh, based in Ottawa and Calgary and working around the world. And over 35 years, they have delivered over 515 projects worldwide. So our three panelists have a rich uh, history of experience uh, that they can share with us. So I'll just give a brief um, overview of their background and you can see it as well in the chat. So Erin Quibell is the Senior Policy Analyst with Global Affairs Canada. She is um, working the International Assistance Policy Coordination Division, leading on Canada's in international implementation of the UN 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. She's been working with Global Affairs or previously Canadian International Development Agency since 2008. So I'm sure she's seen a lot of very interesting changes over the years uh, and has been involved in a lot of Canada's engagement around the world. Uh, working on human rights, democracy, and environmental projects uh, in Eastern Europe and the Southern Caucasus through Canada's partnership with the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe. Over the last 12 years, Erin has predominantly worked on UN global frameworks such as the Millennium Development Goals uh, and the 2030 Agenda, as well as other multilateral forums, forums, including four years working on multilateral issues such as gender, as the gender equality policy analyst. She's got a BA in German and history and an MA in German literature and language from Memorial University. So welcome Erin to our panel. Um, second, we have Ms. Tando, Tando Malambo, which, who's the Senior Strategic Knowledge Translation Officer at the International Development Research Council. She advises on and leads work to advance IDRC's corporate priorities related to knowledge translation and thought leadership, including work on gender and equity in the context of the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, so we're excited to have her here, and she's also working on her PhD in gender and development. So we'll be hearing a bit from her about some of the work she's been involved in. And then, and then thirdly, we have Ms. Tanya Saluski, 
who's a program management special specialist with Alenia International. She has over 25 years experience in global health development and organizational capacity building, um, focused on reproductive, maternal and child health, health systems, gender equality and organizational leadership. So she's worked with Alenia, Aga Khan Foundation Canada, the Canadian Nurses Association, the Canadian Public Health Association, UNICEF Botswana, and Aga Khan University. So Tanya comes to us with a lot of different experiences and I look forward to hearing what she's gonna say. Um, and so before we start, uh, I just wanna acknowledge that originally we had planned to have a panelist from MEDA, which is Mennonite Economic Development Aid Associates, an NGO based in Waterloo. Uh, and we were gonna have representatives from their project in the Ukraine, uh, which was a horticulture project with small farmers called the Ukraine Horticulture Business Development Project. Um, but sadly and understandably, they had to bow out in the last few days because of the worsening crisis there. So our thoughts and best wishes are with them um, and their team for their safety. Uh, we'll put the link of the project uh, in the chat. You can go explore it later. So I wanna give a huge thanks to Tondo and Tanya for stepping in with literally three days notice to please uh, join our panel, um, but they were gracious and able to join and have a lot of great things to share. So uh, it, it's great to have them here. So just to outline the format for the panel, I'm gonna be asking each of the panelists a couple of questions that they will be sharing about their work. Uh, and then at the end, when all three have spoken, then we're gonna have time for questions and interaction from you, the audience. So as I said at the beginning, please, Put in your comments or questions uh, in the chat and the Q&A section or think about them at the end and put them in uh, and then we want to have some interaction with you um, about what has been shared and possibly your, your relevant experience in, in some of the topics that they've raised. So let's jump into it. Uh, we'll start with Aaron Quibell from Global Affairs Canada. Aaron, uh, how is Global Affairs contributing to the achievement of the Sustainable Development Goals and ensuring no one is left behind. Thanks, Chris. Um, before I get into the answer, I just wanted to acknowledge that uh, I am speaking from, and, and the other panelists today are speaking from the unceded territory of the Algonquin Anishinaabe people, um, Ottawa, Canada. And uh, to answer your question, Global Affairs Canada is taking a gender responsive and human rights-based approach to the sustainable development goals through the feminist international assistance policy, but also through the feminist foreign policy and our inclusive approach to trade. Uh, for us, it's the 2030 agenda, it, it goes beyond international assistance and it's important to leverage all of our efforts, not just development projects, in support of the SDGs to ensure no one is left behind. The call to lead, leave no one behind is a call for the inclusion of all. And meeting the SDGs will require recognizing and supporting the participation and contribution of women, girls, and all of their diversity, as well as persons with disabilities, the LGBTQ2I community, Indigenous peoples, and other marginalized groups. We all have a role in realizing an inclusive and resilient recovery from the pandemic and the achievement of the 2030 Agenda. Promoting inclusion and respect for diversity contributes um, to the realization of human rights and gender equality and peace and prosperity, which is critical for advancing the SDGs and creating a just and inclusive and peaceful society. Um, so what does that look like in a practical sense? I, I can give you a couple of examples. Um, so in 2019, Canada committed $30 million over five years and $10 million a year per year thereafter to advance the human rights and improve socioeconomic outcomes for people in the LGBTQ2I community in developing countries. And this includes multi-year support to the Act Together for Inclusion Fund, the multi-donor LGBTI human rights initiative managed by USAID, and the Outright Action International's Coronavirus Global LGBTI Emergency Fund. Um, in the last five years, Canada has more than doubled its bilateral assistance investment for supporting persons with disabilities in developing countries from 137 million in 2016-2017 to 346 million in 
These investments support both the integration of disability issues into projects, but also support initiatives targeted towards advancing the human rights and dignity of persons with disabilities. Um, one example I can give you here is um, making sure that the needs and priorities of girls with disabilities were integrated into Canada's $400 million G7 commitment on girls' education. And um, through the Women's Voice and Leadership Program, which is one of our, it's, um, it's a $150 million flagship initiative of the Feminist International Assistance Policy, Canada is supporting 33 projects in 30 different countries around the world that help women's rights organizations to build their organizational strength and advocate for gender equality and provide services to marginalized women and girls in all of their diversity. Great, thank you for that. And as a follow-up question, what opportunities might lie ahead for people interested in sustainable development or international development? You're muted. Sorry about that. I don't know why it muted itself. Anyway, so for us, the 2030 agenda is, is not just about international development. I think I mentioned that a little bit in, in my answer to the first question. We see it as foreign policy and, and, and trade and everything. So it, it is a big, complex global framework, but it also applies to all of us as individuals and as communities and it applies domestically at the, and at the national level as much as it's something that we do internationally uh, with our developing country partners. The 2030 agenda is universal and the goals are interrelated and individual, indivisible and it's a people-centered agenda. And when you think about it in this way, it means that opportunities are everywhere, whether decisions we make as private citizens to take public transit or buy sustainable products reduce our carbon footprint and support and, and how we support our communities and how our governments at all levels respond to challenges like poverty and inequality and climate change and also how we build diverse and inclusive partnerships and alliances to build a better world for everyone. Um, everyone has a role to play and everyone has the right to participate in and contribute to and benefit from realizing the sustainable development goals. Ownership over the goals is important because the SDGs belong to all of us. Um, so after the initial shock of the pandemic two years ago, I began to see beyond the uncertainty and the feeling of powerlessness that imposed on all of us. And what I saw was an opportunity. The 2030 agenda is a roadmap out of the pandemic towards an inclusive and resilient recovery. And it's a path away from all the actions, inactions and choices we have made as a global community that have led us to be living through this current reality. A moment when maybe the often quoted business as usual isn't enough would hit home and drive the paradigm shift that is needed to realize a better world and a better future for everyone. And it's my hope that maybe other people feel the same way. I realize that change takes courage and perseverance, but I hope you'll think about this and see all the opportunities, great and small, that in, exist in this kind of thinking. In terms of international development, there are so many possibilities. You can work for government like I do, but there are also so many civil society organizations and community groups and think tanks and private sector companies out there contributing to the work of sustainable development. So there are really entry points everywhere and you just need to look for them. Um, or you can create your own. And even when we come to the end of the 2030 agenda, eight years from now, sustainable, sustainable development won't be going away. Uh, global challenges will still exist and we'll still need to meet them together. So really the possibilities are endless. Perfect, thank you, Erin. That was some great details of examples of how Canada is involved in the world and how uh, we can be involved too. Sorry, my light is getting a bit glit glitchy, but I'm glad you can still see me. Um, so th think about some questions for Aaron later on, especially if you want to hear a bit more about what the government is doing in, in different areas uh, that you're familiar with and put those in the Q&A or uh, add them at the end when it's um, that time for in interaction. Let's jump over to you, Tando, to talk about IDRC's work. Uh, so IDRC is funding research on the socioeconomic impacts 
of the COVID-19 pandemic, particularly on vulnerable populations. So what are you learning about how the pandemic has worsened existing inequalities? Thanks, Chris. Um, I and mean, I think what we've seen, and this will build um, quite nicely from what Erin had to share, is that the COVID-19 pandemic has really um, hit hard women and gender minority communities. I think we've seen that both the pandemic and um, the measures implemented to control it have really deepened existing inequalities and jeopardized the health and well-being, um, particularly of women, of gender minority communities and LGBTQ plus um, communities as well. Um, IDRC has invested well over $55 million across 65 countries in the global south in research as part of Canada's overall response to the pandemic, um, in research investigating the socioeconomic impacts of the pandemic and really seeking to inform equitable responses, you know, to that point that recovery has to be inclusive and equitable. And I think our research has shown, for example, how the pandemic has increased income insecurity and food insecurity for the most vulnerable, especially for women-led households, for informal workers, for residents in rural areas. We've also seen how lockdowns and restrictions have limited access to sexual and reproductive health services. Um, and this has hit hard on LGBTQ2 plus communities um, who are, whose vulnerability has been exacerbated by lack of access to psychosocial supports and other social services. And I think we've also seen as well how an increased burden of care that women have taken on in this pandemic within the wake of school closures and restrictions has really impacted both the quality and quantity of the work they're able to do. It has undermined their health and well-being and reinforced harmful gender norms. And I think as well, you know, soberingly, we've seen the nature of vulnerability itself actually changing in this pandemic in that the pandemic has produced new forms of vulnerability and has shed light on vulnerabilities that previously may not have been as noticed. You know, and so for example, in some parts of the world, urban populations have now become more vulnerable than those in rural areas because the virus can spread more easily in dense, highly populated areas where it's more difficult to confine. And in particular, people living in urban slums or informal settlements, um, which are also unsanitary, are at a greater disadvantage. And so all of this, I think, highlights the importance of really rethinking our understanding of vulnerability. And I think recognizing that some of the groups that tend to get lumped together in development, such as the poor or informal workers, that these groups are not cohesive or homogenous and that their experiences are varied and that it's gonna be really important to get at data that's better disaggregated to really ensure we're capturing and addressing the multiple layers of vulnerability Vulnerability is complex, and I think this pandemic has made it even more complex in terms of that call to recognize that it's a deep um, underlying issues at play here, multiple intersecting inequalities, and how do we address those? You know, so in some, I think we're seeing inequalities deepen. We're seeing certain populations um, sort of falling through the cracks, and we're also seeing them becoming vulnerable in ways that they may not have been before in the wake of this pandemic. Thank you for that. Um, and and then as we so as we look forward towards Agenda 2030, uh, what can or should be done to address these inequalities that you've highlighted? I think um, reflecting back on something Arian said about you know Agenda 2030 being universal, if we're going to take that into account that this is universal. I think when we look at what we're seeing in this pandemic, as far as the inequalities that are widening, we're going to have to think really hard about what it means to design policies and interventions that are truly inclusive, that ensure that the needs of women, of gender minorities, of LGBTQ plus communities are really taken into account. You know, and so this means, for example, what we, what we do with ensuring that government relief measures are adequate and actually accessible for all, including minority communities, um, food aid, cash grants, the kinds of social supports that people need in times of crisis. How do we address accessibility issues? It's also thinking about what it means, I think, to take a truly intersectional vulnerability sensitive approach to addressing these inequalities and recognizing that one size fits all responses are not going to work. You know, that people's individual experiences vary that we're not talking about one kind of inequality here, but we're talking about multiple layers 
of inequality. We're talking about intersecting systems of oppression, intersecting forms of disadvantage that really coincide in painful ways to exacerbate vulnerability. You know, and so that requires nuanced approaches that consider all these forms of vulnerability and how they intersect in people's individual lives. Um, it also, you know, means rethinking unpaid care work and how do we address the unpaid care work crisis? How do we invest in childcare um, to better support women, boost employment, job retention, to allow women to better and fully participate in the workforce? And I think, you know, when you look across all these layers of inequality and vulnerability, we know that we want and we need an inclusive recovery. We know that we need a recovery that is equitable. But getting there, I think, is going to require really addressing um, the specific needs of women, of gender minority communities, of LGBTQ plus communities, and ensuring that we address the inequalities um, in assets and in income, access to food, public services, employment, um, that all these layers are actually addressed. Because if agenda 2030 is truly universal as it is, and the goal is to leave no one behind, then this kind of recovery is more important than ever, ensuring that we're being truly inclusive and truly equitable across the board. Fantastic, thank you. Thank you for that. And I encourage, encourage you as well to think about your questions for Tondo, especially about um, the this intersectional vulnerability and some of the other um, points that she raised about how we can respond to the unequal uh, vulnerability that we're seeing around the world. And we've definitely seen this pandemic exacerbate those differences and we see the inequalities that exist. Um, so I encourage you to think about discussion for that after. Uh, uh, Tanya, over to you. Um, looking a bit at your um, programs and work with Alania, what has been your experience in incorporating inclusion or diversity in international development programming? What does that look like and how has that played out? First off, I think it's important to acknowledge that as a white Canadian woman working in development, I have a privileged voice and I don't want to position myself as an expert on diversity and inclusion. Um, it's critical for us to acknowledge and understand the colonial history of the sector that we work in. And the fact that we are only just now as a sector starting to reckon with this, we've got a long, long way to go. Um, and as a person in a position of privilege, it's my responsibility to use that privilege to create space for the experiences and voices of others. And quite frankly, to often shut up and get out of the way as much as possible. Um, I'd like to start by saying that we undertake uh, this work in the context of a sector with deep structural inequalities. We still use the language of donors and beneficiaries. We have head offices and we have the field. Um, we've got headquarter-led organizations that operate in a Canadian context where the Canada Revenue Agency requires that Canadian organizations demonstrate that they have direction and control over how funding is used. Um, we find to be successful at getting GAC funding, it often requires a Canadian interlocutor that understands how GAC works, how to meet demands for planning, reporting, compliance and accountability. It creates challenges for collaborative approaches, um, and, and not least of which is engaging local partners in project design. We do project design work for free. We don't, we don't get paid for project design or proposal development, so any work done ahead of time and upfront is, is unpaid. Um, and so when we want to be inclusive, we're asking people with maybe less time and, and fewer resources to, to do that work without any guarantee that there's gonna be something at the end of it. And so to work around, um, around this requires flexibility and understanding from the donor. And sometimes we, we have that and sometimes we don't necessarily. Um, it also requires soul searching and commitment to specific practices on the part of head offices. And these are, are often new and they can be challenging and difficult. Uh, it also creates a high-risk environment for tokenism, uh, especially when a substantial amount of the decision-making power is retained at the head office. Development organizations across the board are struggling with these issues uh, and, and working on them. And I come out of the, the, the consulting sector. So for consulting companies and for individual consultants, technical expertise is our product. 
Um, however, in Olinia's experience and my own experience, technical expertise, these hard skills, they need to be accompanied by a high level of soft skills or cultural competence if they're going to be of any use at all. So we seek to retain people that have these kinds of skills, and that includes the ability to understand and relate to difference, to build respectful and collaborative relationships with others, to recognize and always be aware of the power dynamics inherent in how we relate to the people we work with in other countries and, and in Canada. So good consultants commit to understanding the history and the culture and the socio-political dynamics, the complexity of the communities where we work, um, but we also need to be able to bring other people's ideas, experiences, and perspectives to the table with equal weight. You know, I always say you can Google, you can Google specific technical information, but you can't Google how to engage in a respectful and collaborative way with colleagues. And that's colleagues in, in Canada, colleagues in other countries, colleagues that don't speak English, colleagues that uh, have a wide variety of, of backgrounds um, and of expertise that may or may not be recognized uh, outside of their own context. I want, I want to speak to, about one of Alinea's current projects, and it's very specifically aimed at integrating diversity and inclusion as a core part of how it works. Um, it's an expert deployment mechanism. So, so what it does is uh, locate and deploy Canadian expertise to um, short-term technical uh, assignments. Globally, uh, they're requested by governments when we deploy people. And one of the things that's interesting and new about this program is that one of the outcomes is specifically around diversifying the provision of Canadian technical assistance. And this addresses the situation that we have where uh, these, these people positioned as experts are overwhelmingly globally, they're white haired white men and occasionally white haired white women. Um, and so the, the Canadian expert is, it meets this, this sort of a uh, very stereotypical thought about who has knowledge and who has knowledge worth sharing. So one thing we really welcome about this project is that it provides a very specific avenue to overcome that. And it has a diversity in the consultant pool as a stated and measured result for the project. And so to accomplish this, we are working um, to diversify our recruitment, reaching out to non-traditional actors, building relationships with non-traditional sources for consulting expertise, um, and uh, building up the capacity and experience of international development uh, for inter international development technical assignments with people during their onboarding and mission preparation. Um, we want to demonstrate that uh, Canada has a wide range of expertise for looking at diaspora communities as sources um, and, and uh, non-traditional uh, partners as well. And um, this is, a, I think, a really exciting opportunity to really work on integrating diversity and inclusion, not only into what we do, but into how we do it. And we're really grateful to, to Global Affairs for, for the, the opportunity to do that. Thank you very much. Um, so follow up question. Can you tell us about Alania's experience implementing program that makes a contribution to achieving the relevant uh, SDGs, in particular SDG 5, gender equality and SDG 10, reducing inequalities? Sure. Thanks, Chris. Uh, Global Affairs Canada's adoption of the feminist international assistance policy that uh, Aaron referenced earlier has created a lot of space for the development sector in Canada to specifically address the SDGs that target equality. Um, two of our newest projects at Alinea will be doing some groundbreaking, groundbreaking work in this space. Um, they both have rights and equality centered within both the, the what of the project and the how. And by that, I mean the, the, the what is the, the results the project seeks to achieve and the how is the approaches that we use to achieve them. Um, and I would argue that a commitment to achieving uh, equality focused results requires us to work in new ways, to change how we work essentially. Um, and for example, I'm going to tell you about our leadership promotion and gender-based violence prevention project in Central America. It res has responded to a call for proposals on women as agents of change. So in this project, we're working with municipal governments and organizations led by women, youth, and indigenous peoples to address gaps related to equal participation in decision-making, 
to equal access to and control over resources and equal realization of rights for women and vulnerable groups in El Salvador, in Guatemala, and in Honduras. And in these three countries, leadership and decision-making positions are very heavily male-dominated. Um, women face challenges having their voices heard and being represented in decision-making and leadership positions. Um, and young people and indigenous people are disproportionately affected by poverty. They face a wide variety of structural and intersectional barriers to meaningfully engage in public leadership and in decision-making processes. And essentially young indigenous women face this sort of triple burden of, uh, of disadvantage. And it's exacerbated by high levels of violence and insecurity and sexual and gender-based violence. So the project is working to strengthen the leadership capacities, uh, to increase representation in municipal public management, to address participation, voice and rights gaps, and to address the capacities of municipalities and community-led organizations and communities to provide services and support for survivors of sexual and gender-based violence. And we're doing this through um, primarily supporting and working with organizations that are led by women, by youth, and by Indigenous people, um, and, and uh, working on their collaborations and, and work with municipal governments to support inclusion. Another project that is just getting underway now in, in Jamaica specifically addresses barriers faced by adolescent girls and vulnerable and stigmatized populations, which in the context of this project refers specifically to sex workers and the LGBT community in accessing respectful, inclusive, and rights-based sexual and reproductive health information and services. And this project is also uh, engaging with and empowering members of these groups as agents of change through undertaking peer-led research and advocacy. Um, and how, how do you do this kind of work? And I think some of the, the important strategies that we use is working with local experts and building on local capacity and efforts. So we're working closely with local advocacy and service organizations that are led by members of marginalized groups to co-design uh, a project that builds on locally led efforts to reduce stigma and discrimination and to promote human rights. Um, and this includes in Jamaica, especially around issues of sexual orientation and gender identity, which is a, a, an area where, where there's still um, uh, same-sex relationships are, are criminalized still, as they are in many countries. Uh, so we're using approaches that, as far as possible, within the confines of a donor-funded project, seek to co-design, co-create, and co-direct activities with members of the project's um, so-called target beneficiary groups. Mm -hmm. And this is built into project activities, making it part of, of how we work. Great, thank you. It's great to hear those specific examples of the work that you've been involved in in those projects for addressing uh, vulnerable populations. So we have about 12 minutes left in our panel, and we want to have a chance to have engagement with the rest of you that are here and not on camera. Um, and uh, so I encourage you, if anybody has uh, questions, please put them in the Q&A and our panelists can share um, from their organization's experience or their own personal experience. Um, so please stick them in there. Uh, while we, I don't see any right now, um, but while we wait for any questions to be put in there, um, Tanya, you gave a number of examples of specific projects. I'm wondering, uh, Tanya and Aaron, if you have um, specific examples of projects or research or initiatives that you've seen that have worked well in reaching uh, populations that have generally been more vulnerable, and especially in this pandemic, um, maybe you can just share a little bit about that, of what, they're, what is happening, and maybe why you think they were successful. Who would like to go first? So just basically a practical example of some of the issues that you've been talking about that we can learn from for others' experience. Well, Chris, I um, I, I work in policy, so I'm 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 going to let Tanya maybe take a first crack at this, so I can think about it a little bit. Or or even in terms of policy, what has worked well, but you can think about it if you if you want Tando to answer first. 
Um, sure. I mean, I think one of the things that I'll say, and definitely sort of builds up on the point that Tanya made, is I think the importance of local community-led solutions as something that is really important when it comes to building resilience, but also supporting recovery within the context of this pandemic and beyond for the SDG agenda. You know, and so one of the things what, that we're we're seeing with our work at IDRC, for example, is even if you look across the global research ecosystem, there are glaring inequalities there. Where um, if you look at the research on COVID, for example, most of it is come, has been coming from the global north, where Southern voices and Southern research have been underrepresented. And so one of the things that IDRC has really taken on ourselves to do is work um, collaboratively with Southern researchers to, um, to build, to identify, uh, and scale up solutions that are locally led and community based. So to give you an example, um, one of our research partners in Peru, um, what has happened in Peru because of the food insecurity rising in the wake of the pandemic is that there have been numerous um, women run community kitchens that have come up that are known as common pots. And these common pots have sprung up, not just in Peru, but also in neighboring countries um, as a means to help feed many um, who need support, who've been hit particularly hard by food insecurity in the wake of the pandemic. And so working with Peruvian policymakers, one of our partners, the group for the anal analysis of development is helping make these community kitchens more sustainable and effective. You know, so for example, they're helping design a national zero hunger program that channels food supplies to these community kitchens. And they're also offering management training and nutrition training to the women who operate these community kitchens. And so I think what you're seeing there is really just a, a, a group that is committed to working at the grassroots level, not to you know, impose solutions, but to say, you know, what's already happening in the community and how can we support and scale up what is happening to ensure that you're working with women, you're working with communities that are hit the hardest, you're working with people who are sort of you know, on the front lines in terms of experiencing the vulnerability of the pandemic to design solutions and scale them up. So that's one example that I would give. And I think that really speaks to the importance of supporting community-led, locally-led solutions as critical um, for the, not just pandemic recovery, but the SDG agenda itself. Yeah, thank you very much. That's, that's so true that it has to be local and community-led um, for generating solutions to uh, the issues that they're addressing and um, not not imposing our outside perspectives that aren't fitting at all with what is needed there. So we have a couple questions uh, here. Uh, so this is first one's a question for, for Tando and Aaron. There are some discussions about ensuring that we don't lose sight of the fact that inequalities between women and men within our patriarchal society is still pervasive and is the foundation of our gender equality approach. While we still acknowledge the various forms of oppression and exclusions that an individual can face based on other key identity factors. So how can we avoid letting the feminist core of our work be diluted by taking into consideration these various dimensions? Who wants to take a crack at that? So you can you just read the last little bit to me again? How can we avoid letting the feminist core of our work be diluted by taking into consideration these various dimensions. We talk about patriarchal society, uh, inequalities between men and women. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. So, um, we maybe different people have different understandings of what feminist means. Um, for for me, it's about believing in equality of all people. Sorry, I've got a timer. I have to stop because patriarchy hurts everybody. It's, you know, um, there are gender norms that hurt men. There are tons of gender norms that hurt women and girls. Um, and they, they also hurt non-binary persons and people who, from the LGBTQ community. Um, so when we, we talk about feminist international assistance policy, like we, it, it means that we're working through, anytime we do something, we're looking at it through um, an intersectional gender-based analysis lens and a human rights lens. And so um, it's, yes, it's about women and girls, but it's about everybody. And, and, and trying to 
um, I think Tando pointed out, you know, you can't have these one one size fits all approaches. You you have to recognize that, you know, everybody has a lived experience and everyone, sorry, I have a cat that won't leave my desk. Um, you have to take those needs and priorities and interests into, into account when, when you're trying to reach people. And I don't know if I've gotten off track, but I, 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 don't, I don't think taking a feminist or a human rights based approach dilutes anything. I think it's about trying to be as inclusive as possible. Um, I hope that answers yeah. the question. Yeah, and, and I think that's so important. I've seen that in my work too, that if you only target women in any program and empower them, but without addressing the men and the other people yeah. in the relationship, yeah. you're, you're exacerbating inequalities because they're coming up against other groups that are holding the power and it has to have them, everybody working together. And, and, I, and I think it's about recognizing that um, it's, it's, it's not about people who don't have power want to take away that power and, and, and leave the people who have power now powerless, it's about sharing that power. And I, I never see power as a zero sum pie. I see it as um, the more we share power and we use our power to lift others up and, and, and to support our communities, um, that there's more to go around. And, and I, you know, I, I feel like we, we come at a lot of things from a scarcity perspective when really, if we were to just recognize that sharing brings abundance oh. and we, we might get somewhere. Yeah. yeah, and I would, um, sorry, can you mind if I come in, Chris? I think I would, I would agree with that 100%. I think I would add that it's, it's also thinking about moving beyond the binaries in development. You know, we tend to talk about girls, women and girls, and I think we're starting to recognize and we should, you know, that gender um, sort of oppression is not just women and girls, right? There are other um, populations along the spectrum that also fall in between the cracks and we need to pay attention to those populations as well. Um, so I completely agree with that. And if I could, I because there's another question in the chat too about decolonial approaches in development. And I think this this ties in a little bit as well. So what we're discussing right now and the question of how we, we talk about men, women, um, and gender in development, because I think part of thinking through what decolonial approaches are is also I think recognizing that um, gender equality, empowerment, oppression, that these things mean different things in different contexts. And I think when you look at the, the sort of like donor um, uh, recipient sort of binary and the power relations in that um, relationship is that oftentimes gender equality and empowerment, these are terms that get defined from the donor perspective of this is what we think empowerment means. And I think a decolonial turn to that is thinking about, look, not that what we think empowerment is, but what are the ways of being empowered, the ways of being and doing that actually matter to groups in that community and how do we come alongside them in addressing the issues that really matter to where they are at that point in time. So I think it's part of that to their approach to gender in, in taking a decolonial turn is thinking through not defining what empowerment should look like, but understanding what it does look like in different contexts and working alongside these populations in thinking about how we get at empowerment. And then I think it's um, it's also paying attention to language. And I say this hesitantly because I just use the term empowerment myself, but I think it's paying attention to the kinds of words we use in development, you know, like middle income country, um, developing, develop. These binaries have um, a raised history behind them, you know, and, and to Tanya's point, there is a colonial history to the language of development itself. So even words like empowerment, you know, who's empowering who and who has the right to empower who? Like, I think there's just a whole nother line of thinking there, paying attention to the words that we use and the, the language we use and how we use it and ensuring that we're conscious of the racial undertones behind some of this language. And, you know, we may, we may not have better terms to use, but at least be conscious of it and challenge some of that as well. Thank you very much. Those were great answers to it. And I see that we have come to the end of our time. Uh, we're in the last minute or so of our session. So I want to thank uh, our panelists, Aaron, Tanya, and Tando, for your great um, contributions here and sharing your, your work experiences and uh, challenging us to think about yeah, how we can um, be 
helping address these inequalities and see the complexity of them and not group everybody together in um, one population or one target group, but seeing the complexity of it and the need to approach these um, issues with the respect that they require and the various approaches that are needed. So um, thank you everyone for joining us and for your questions and uh, choosing to spend this, these last 45 minutes with us. I hope you benefited from this and I uh, encourage you to keep having conversations about this. So thank you everyone and have a good afternoon. Thanks everyone.